Second World War, the German Air Force had three remarkable fighter aircraft. The Messerschmitt 109, the Focke Wolf 190, and the ME 262. This is their story. Flying at 30,000 feet over Europe, 8th Air Force crews are on high alert, but these are the early years. But they had already learned that the risks were high, flying in box formations. The aircraft are very close together. This exposed the planes to the risk of mid-air collision, and even worse, they provided a far better target for German anti-aircraft guns, against which there was no protection. So why would the American crews fly in such a precarious manner? The answer is, it provided the B-17 gunners the best defense against the greatest threat, the German single-seat day fighter. The first raids into Germany had proved very costly. Often, more than 10% of the planes did not return. Cut from the skies by Luftwaffe pilots, skilled and well-armed, they put the whole question of daytime bombing in doubt. Losing eight men in a four-engine heavy bomber to a relatively low-cost single-place fighter was starting not to make economic sense. other costs. Another 10% of the planes that did return were badly damaged and often brought home casualties who would never see service again. Smoldering remains in both Britain and Germany were sad monuments to the terrible effectiveness of Luftwaffe single-seat day fighters. And yet throughout the entire conflict, there were only three major types of aircraft that filled this role. The first was a legend, the Messerschmitt Model 109. Perhaps best known of all German Luftwaffe aircraft, it served in enormous numbers. Germany's second most prolific fighter, and certainly its most effective propeller-driven plane, was the redoubtable Focke-Wulf Model 190. Allowed into production only because it used less popular engines, the 190 saw service wherever the Luftwaffe fought. Heavily armed and extremely fast, the 190 was aptly named the Butcher Bird. But the speed and firepower of earlier propeller aircraft paled in comparison to the Luftwaffe's most advanced fighter, the Messerschmitt Model 262. The tradition of good German fighter designs began in an earlier conflict, that of World War I, fought under dreadful conditions in the trenches of France. This conflict also saw the first use of air power. The German military was quick to develop new aircraft, like the Fokker triplane and scores of biplanes, all of which relied on wood and fabric for their construction. Although these frail aircraft performed in many roles, the most prolific and the most important was the fighter. Apart from establishing Germany's aircraft industry, the Great War also created legends in the form of fighter pilots, the most successful of whom became known as aces. This is Hermann Goering, 
an ace in his own right, who also held the Iron Cross for bravery. Goering's early reputation as one of Germany's boldest fighter pilots included one story when he was attacked by no less than 20 British aircraft. His plane riddled with bullets, he was shot out of the sky and yet survived the crash. Although badly wounded, he was back flying within a month. Within two decades, this man would teach the entire world a lesson on air power they would never forget. Every month, hundreds of young air crews were sent to fight a war they thought could not be lost. Tens of thousands would never return. Supporting these men was an industry constantly refining its crew designs, always trying to gain an edge over the enemy. Wooden propellers were driven by primitive engines, often unreliable and prone to overheating. All of the power plants of the time had their problems. Engines came in one of two formats. First, there was the air-cooled radial concept, where the cylinders were placed around the crankshaft, as with this early German monoplane. The cylinders actually rotated against a fixed crankshaft to increase airflow and reduce overheating. These were called rotaries. In other radial designs, the cylinders were static and the crankshaft moved, but the overheating problem was never really solved. Guns were timed to fire through the propeller arc. There was also the water-cooled inline engine. It allowed a more aerodynamic shape and proved more reliable, but the extra water pipes and radiators also resulted in a more complex system than the radial engine. Constant development of German aircraft did not, however, save the nation from defeat. Under the terms of the armistice, Germany was forbidden to build any aircraft except those with a purely civil function. But at least the skill of aircraft making was being kept alive, preserved for prouder days. This is a German civilian aircraft designed for passenger transport. Quite advanced for the time, it was funded in part by the newly emerging German national airline, Lufthansa. When the plane crashed on a test flight, its manufacturers fell into bankruptcy. But the firm was quickly reformed and later adopted the name of its new director and driving force, Messerschmitt. In 1933, saw a new force sweep through Germany. The Nazi party under Adolf Hitler had come to power, promising new greatness to a nation that had suffered the humiliation of defeat, the staggering cost of reparations, and a cruel depression. The Nazis symbolized a new sense of national pride and a chance for Germany to be great again. Hitler mesmerized his followers. He revitalized industry, put the nation back to work, and dismissed the terms of the armistice. Now was the time for Germany to reassert itself, to rearm with new weapons, especially warplanes for the new air force, the Luftwaffe, under Field Marshal Hermann Göring. At first, there was caution. Even aircraft like the Ju-86 bomber were developed under a civilian airline project. Although very few passenger planes were ever made, the 86's destructive potential was secretly refined into an effective weapon. 
Far more powerfully, the first Nazi fighters looked not too dissimilar from the biplanes of the Great War. But soon, a more modern replacement would be required. It came indirectly from a genuine civilian concept, the Messerschmitt Model 108. The sports plane so impressed the Luftwaffe with its simple, clean lines and its relatively low cost of construction that a fighter version seemed a logical progression. Even with its sleeker shape and its vastly more powerful engine, the Model 109 shared many features with the 108. The narrow undercarriage and demountable wings were all legacies from the sports plane. But no 108 ever had machine guns or a cannon that fired through the propeller hub. The 109 had a water-cooled Daimler-Benz inline engine. For streamlining, the radiators were positioned just under the wing. 109s were first used by German pilots in the Spanish Civil War. But this was just a test for a different war, carefully planned and ruthlessly executed. The German invasion of Poland in 1939 quickly condemned a proud nation to servitude. In the process, started the Second World War. The Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber also saw service in Spain where it was used to develop an entirely new form of warfare, Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. Protected by Messerschmitt 109 fighter cover, Stukas wrecked havoc not only in Poland, but then in Norway, Holland, and Belgium, whose small air forces were ill-equipped to deal with the new Luftwaffe. Many of these nations still flew biplanes or monoplane fighters with fixed undercarriage, which made them less agile. Even the more advanced types, like these Brewster Buffaloes purchased from America, were few in number and totally outclassed by Messerschmitt fighters. Their attempts to stop German bombers were brave, but futile. of Blitzkrieg soon produced the intended results as one small nation after another fell to the Nazi juggernaut. Soon, even the powerful French would endure invading forces for the second time in just over two decades. Committed almost entirely to defending their nation from behind the Maginot Line, they were stunned by a Nazi attack via Belgium. Many of their aircraft were simply destroyed on the ground, never having the chance to fight. Those few that did get in the air lasted but a short time. German forces moved on quickly to the coast, and the British army in France was literally driven into the sea. 
Paris was occupied by German troops, an action that some said could be directly traced to the harsh terms set by France for ending the Great War with Germany. Whilst Hitler and Goering enjoyed the taste of their victories, Luftwaffe crews were quickly preparing for yet another campaign. 109s were serviced by their ground crews. Their powerful V-12 Daimler-Benz engines made ready. The armorers cleaned and restocked the machine guns knowing that the Luftwaffe's pride would soon be back in action again. The gun camera, it was hoped, would record many kills, this time kills against the British. But for some time before the fall of France, there had been a lull. Some called it the phony war. Then, on July 16, 1940, the German Air Force attacked Britain with its bombers. The 109 was to act as escort. Fleets of Luftwaffe medium bombers and Stuka dive bombers, their crews confident in the protection of 109 fighters, made for British airfields. But the British had used the valuable time gained in the phony war well. And now, unlike Poland and France, they were prepared. More importantly, the British had a fighter that was a match even for the 109. The Supermarine Spitfire was about as fast as the Messerschmitt, and certainly more maneuverable. And Spitfire pilots had another advantage, they were fighting over their own ground. British Spitfires and Hurricanes sustained dreadful losses, but less than those inflicted on the Luftwaffe. In the summer of 1940, a few hundred Royal Air Force pilots in their planes were all that stood between Nazi domination and the free world. They were enough. As in the Great War, the ranks of German fighter pilots would yield a few exceptional men, aces of a different era. Pilots like Adolf Gallen did well over Britain, and his natural leadership skills led him to be named General of Fighters. The German war effort now called for even more fighters. 109 production was increased, but still the need was not fulfilled. One problem was that the Daimler-Benz engine was in short supply. Not only was it needed for 109s, but also for twin-engine fighter bombers like the Messerschmitt 110, the 210, and later the 410, all seen with vital roles to play. Every time one of these aircraft came off the production line, it stopped two 109s from being produced. An answer had to be found. There was one engine produced by BMW that was in plentiful supply. 
but it was of the air-cooled radio configuration and not well liked by German fighter designers. With little else to work with, the Focke-Wulf company took the BMW radial and produced what was probably the best all-around piston power fighter of the Second World War. It was the FW-190, the Butcher Bird. The 190's designer, Kurt Tonk, considered the Butcher Bird to be his masterpiece. Developed under a totally different philosophy than the 109, the 190 was heavier and certainly stronger than the Messerschmitt. The wings were joined together as one piece before mating to the fuselage. This meant that unlike the 109, they couldn't be removed for ease of transport. But the tougher construction was later to be appreciated. Thousands of Luftwaffe pilots would literally owe their lives to the Focke-Wulf's ability to sustain dreadful damage and still return home. German plane-making skills, preserved from the first war, were now paying dividends. But the early 190s had a major problem with the large radial engine which made for a very unaerodynamic nose. To counter this, the first prototype was fitted with a special cone and a fan, one to improve the plane's shape and the other to assist in cooling. But the cone-fan combination simply didn't work, and test pilot Saunders complained that flying the 190 was like having your feet in a baker's oven. The problem of overheating was solved in two ways. First, by placing the pilot farther back in the fuselage, and second, by dropping the cone concept for a conventional engine column. The reduction in aerodynamic efficiency was compensated for by a slightly more powerful engine, and its extra weight was already balanced by repositioning the pilot behind the center of gravity. The wide track undercarriage was a complete contrast to the narrow gear on the 109, but on the downside, the huge radio drastically reduced the pilot's vision when taxiing. Focke Wolf 190s first went into action against British Spitfires on September the 27th, 1941. Early model Spitfires may have been a match for the Messerschmitt, but they were not adequate to deal with the 190 Butcher Bird. Soon, Hitler's attention was to turn away from Britain. His real ambition had always been towards the East and against Russia. Coming a year earlier than Stalin had predicted, Operation Barbarossa caught the Soviets completely by surprise. Focke-Wulf 190s had a field day with a few antiquated Russian fighters that were not destroyed on the ground. With another enemy to fight, demands for both types of German fighters increased, although by now it was quite clear that the 190 was the far superior plane. Radial's advantages were not entirely overlooked by the Red Air Force. Russian engineers soon started to convert some of their own inline engine aircraft to radial motors. With extra power and better airframes, the Soviets soon had the tools to counter even the Butcher Bird. It wasn't long before their pilots developed greater skills, 
with which they turned the German advance into a retreat rivaling that of Napoleon. Unaccustomed to such harsh conditions, Luftwaffe pilots had to fight on against an enemy born to the cold. But worse still, as with the British, Russians were fighting on and for their own land. For the Germans on the Eastern Front, the news from home was also bad. By 1942, the United States was into the war and committed to its policy to destroy Nazi war production. Eighth Air Force heavy bombers were hitting targets right in the industrial heart of Germany, disrupting the supply of munitions critical to the German cause. The Luftwaffe's problem was that American bombers flew at heights up to 30,000 feet, stretching the radial power of the FW-190 to its limits. If the tools of war were still to flow, the Luftwaffe would need a high-altitude fighter. But with little time for development, German engineers would have to improvise. While they worked, there were daily reminders of the cost of delay. The Focke-Wulf designers solved the problem with the 190D model. The long nose now housed a large, water-cooled inline engine that was originally intended for a Junkers bomber. As with the early prototype, the extra weight in the front end had to be compensated by extending the fuselage behind the center of gravity. a much longer aircraft with greater power and altitude, the D model posed a serious threat to U.S. bombers. But like so many German innovations of the war, it simply came too late. As did the Reich jet program. The Heinkel 178 first flew in August of 1939, 20 months ahead of the first British jet. But the concept wasn't taken seriously by the Luftwaffe for some time. Despite problems of reliability and lack of power, the 178 at least proved jet aircraft were viable. Heinkel's next attempt was with a two-engine jet-powered fighter. As an airframe, the HE-280 was ready in September of 1940, but new jet engines were still some way off. So for almost a year, the Heinkel test crews had to be content with glider trials all of which confirm the 280's excellent aerodynamic features. The 280's sleek lines and tricycle undercarriage would have been worthy of a design offered five years later but it was declined in favor of this aircraft. When equipped with the same engines as the 280, the Messerschmitt 262 was actually slower, and the early prototype had a more primitive tail wheel. But it did have two advantages. First, it carried almost twice as much fuel, and therefore offered greater range than the 280. And of equal importance was that its nose contained four cannons, which resulted in much greater firepower than the Heinkel. The 262's early undercarriage layout often caused the jet exhaust 
to actually ignite the runway on landing and takeoff. It did, however, prove a very stable platform and quickly won the full support of General of Fighters Adolf Gallup. Despite this, the 262, or Swallow as the pure fighter version was known, still had its detractors in the Nazi high command, and development was slow. Seen here in its operational camouflage, it's easy to see how the sleek and rather menacing lines of the 262 impressed its eagerly awaiting crews. They would be the first servicemen in history to work with the new technology, the jet engine. Today, 50 years later, our fastest aircraft rely on this technology, which first saw service in this truly remarkable German design. The operational models had the more advanced tricycle landing gear, but the innovation constantly caused problems throughout the Swallow's service life, producing a shimmy effect on touchdown that made landing quite a precarious operation. Despite the landing gear problem, the Swallow was a massive step forward. And although it reached service status much later than expected, it was still years ahead of anything the Allies could call upon. Flying the 262 would be a totally new experience for its pilots. There were many considerations to adjust to, some good and some bad, but all different from the lessons they had learned in the past. With no two-seat training models available for some time, early 262 pilots made their first jet flights all on their own. Unlike piston engines, the jet did not seem to respond as quickly. And there was no braking factor when the pilot throttled back as in propeller-driven aircraft. Another concern was that too much revving on the ground would overheat the engines. Once the pilots had come to terms with the new techniques, they soon realized that at long last, Germany had a technological edge with which the Luftwaffe might well save the war, or at least bring peace on an honorable basis. The 262's engines were UMO 004s, made by the Junkers Company, which had also produced the Ju-87 Stuka, one of the war's most effective planes. The UMO jets could each produce up to 2,000 pounds of thrust and were the most powerful of several turbojet designs that Germany produced throughout the war. To put German achievements into perspective, it should be considered just how little the Allies had advanced in jet technology when they had vastly more to work with. The key to Allied jet development was a British design produced by Frank Whittle. It was copied in the U.S. and two were fitted in an experimental fighter designed by the Bell Aircraft Company. The 
XP-59's engines each produced 1,400 pounds of thrust. And when it flew for the first time in October 1942, it achieved a maximum speed of barely 400 miles per hour. By contrast, the 262 made its maiden flight in April of 1941, and the production model had a maximum speed of 520 miles per hour. The Whittle engine was a centrifugal flow concept, where the combustion chambers were external to the main drive shaft. The early Hankel 280s were also fitted with centrifugal flow engines, but these were later discarded for axial flow designs, where the combustion took place around the drive shaft. After the war, Western nations continued using centrifugal designs and got good results. But over time, it was the axial concept that proved to have the greatest potential, something German scientists predicted in 1941. It's hardly surprising that engineers who worked on the jet program were highly sought after by U.S. manufacturers at war's end. Many migrated to new lives in the United States, their former enemy. But even the advanced 004 engine required regular service and often had to be replaced after only 24 hours of operation. Early jets had power, but not durability. Preparing the 262 for takeoff also required special considerations. Sealing of the jet intake until the engine was started was a vital precaution to avoid dirt being ingested. The undercarriage required extra attention when the plane was being towed. The troublesome nose wheel was unable to bear the weight of the plane, so special cables and mounts were used to transfer the tension to the rear wheels while the nose gear was left free to steer. But the greatest problems the 262 had to face was not one of new technology, but one of identity. The great speed advantage made it most suitable for a fighter at a time when Germany needed every fighter it could get, a point emphasized by Gallant. Hitler believed that the best form of defense was attack, and that the 262 should be delivered in its bomber configuration, known as the Stormbird. Galland actually resigned as general of fighters over the decision, and it was only later that Hitler and Goering relented. Why the Fuhrer and his Reichsmarschall felt so strongly about the Stormbird is hard to understand, as the Luftwaffe already had one excellent jet bomber in the Arado 234 Blitz. The Arado Blitz also used UMO 004 engines and was the world's first operational jet bomber, yet another German technological first. The United States had a totally different view on how to use technology. They preferred to improve on established ideas expanding on formulas that were already known to work. Even at the very end of the war, all of the United States fighter work was being done by aircraft like the P-47 Thunderbolt. The Thunderbolt used a radial engine like the FW-190, only it was bigger. 
Here, P-47 Thunderbolts are being assembled at a base in England, where they had been shipped in boxes from factories in America. Turbocharged, the Thunderbolt could reach speeds of over 400 miles an hour, but its greatest advantage was its range. P-47s, P-38s, and P-51s were all equipped with outboard fuel tanks, which could be jettisoned just before combat. The extra range gained by drop tanks and by cramming fuel into every vacant space in the plane enabled U.S. fighters to escort 8th Air Force bombers all the way to Germany. Later, when Allied fighter bases were available in France and Belgium, they were able to provide total fighter cover to American heavy bombers. These advances in range and constant improvement to defensive fire from within the bombers would allow B-17s and B-24s to fly right into the heart of the fatherland on thousands of missions with greatly reduced losses. The fighters became known to bomber crews as little friends. Friends indeed, for in the freezing air 30,000 feet over Germany, the crews of fortresses and liberators would need all the help they could get. The fact that fighter help was there would cost Germany the war. As the offensive built up, crews on both sides braced for the tests of pilot skill and aircraft superiority. All knew the ultimate collapse of Germany was just a matter of time. Allied losses could be replaced. German losses could not. Even knowing this, Luftwaffe pilots would fight to the end. For now, they had an advantage their British and Russian foes had one share. They were fighting for their homeland the fatherland. In the final days, the Messerschmitt 109s, the Focke-Wulf 190s, and the Swallows would fight together for the last time.
Eventually, the last bomb would fall, and invading Allied troops would see the dreadful damage that had been done to the towns and cities of a once great power. A sad ending to the Reich that would last a thousand years. Hitler had united a tattered Germany which survived the First Great War, only to expose it to another, even more painful fate, all within 12 tempestuous years. Beyond the ruined towns were the airfields. Some were still launching aircraft as the surrender was being signed. Occupying troops would find examples of German warplanes, once feared and always revered, now, like the nation itself, broken. Even in defeat and beyond repair, Luftwaffe aircraft were reminders of a great nation's marvelous technology, a tribute to its designers, its engineers, its factory workers, and especially its pilots, who for over six years had flown and fought as the whole world had become the enemy. Deprived of its resources and gradually watching its allies fall, the Fatherland came to rely more and more on its air force, on the Luftwaffe, as the only means of defending its people. Hermann Goering had once predicted that the next great war would be a war in the air. And he was right. He was also right in his confidence in German genius and industry. Taking the world into the jet age was more than proof of that. Where he and his mentor had failed was simply in pursuing the wrong cause. <laughs> 